I'm here in conversation with award-winning author John Larkin. John, welcome. Thank you, Stefan. I've got some questions for you about your latest novel, The Pause. I have some general questions and then go into more specific questions about, about the novel itself. What inspired you to become an author? I was travelling around Europe as a young man and I used to be a semi-professional soccer player and uh, I damaged my knee beyond repair. And while travelling around Europe I got really into art and literature and culture and I also had this mishmash of thoughts running around in my head like most young people do and I needed an outlet for those thoughts and writing was the perfect, became the perfect outlet for me. Who inspires you? I'm inspired by people who refuse to take no for an answer, who are able to achieve despite adversity, and the people who go about their business helping others, making the world a better place without conceit or arrogance, and they don't care if their name's out there, just do quiet work behind the scenes to improve everyone's lot. How would you describe your creative process? Well, when I come up with the idea for a novel, I let it percolate around my head for a, two years, a year, depending on how long, how quickly I want to get to it. And then by the time I go to commit some ideas to paper or to laptop, I really know the story inside out. I mean, I, I do allow creativity to take over. Sometimes the story will take me in directions that I hadn't planned, but basically uh, it's just let, let the idea percolate for a while. You've described yourself as a method writer. What does that mean? Well, I like to totally immerse myself in the story and the character. Uh, for instance, it's, sometimes it's difficult when I'm in the process of writing to differentiate between reality and fiction. And there were times when I was writing The Shadow Girl because she was going through such a hard time and perhaps if I was going away on a speaking engagement and I couldn't write while I was away, I would put her in a five-star hotel in the book just to give her a break. And so I felt a sense of uh, obligation to look after her. And readers have told me they didn't like leaving her in a vulnerable situation. They had to read up to the point where she was safe, which is really interesting. So as I'm a method writer, there clearly are there are method readers as well. Do you write for yourself or do you have an audience in mind? First and foremost, it's for me. I have to entertain myself because I do so much rewriting. I always say to my students, good writing isn't written, it's rewritten. Because I'm going through that process all the time, my writing must entertain me, must make me laugh, must make me cry. Because if it doesn't, then if I'm not engaging myself, I can't hope to engage a reader. So because I'm rewriting all the time, I'm not a writer, I'm a rewriter. And so therefore, yeah, I'm my first audience. Why did you choose the young adult genre? I chose to initially work in the YA genre because I didn't have a particularly, I don't have particularly fond memories of being a teenager myself. I mean, I did fall through the cracks. I suppose that was the start of my, my years of battling depression. And by working in the YA genre, I'm able to live vicariously through my characters and give myself the teenage years that I would have liked to have had myself. And so by coming back to this genre, allows me to workshop issues that I still haven't dealt with. And it's just enjoyable to work to work in, with teenagers and to write for them as well. But of course the pause is really for anyone 14 and above. I probably wouldn't like to see it in the hands of primary school students. It's a bit too hard hitting. But um, it's definitely written for teens and up to 90, 100, while well, you can still read. Why did you write the pause? I read the pause because I went through a very difficult time myself. In 2012, I had a complete mental breakdown, which uh, required hospitalisation, first at Hornsby in the emergency psych unit, and then at the Hills Hospital, more long-term facility. And that's where I put Declan. He, he spent time in both those hospitals, reliving what I went through. And uh, I wanted to to delve into that, to, to use my experiences having a breakdown to, uh, to, to help others. And I do recall when I was in hospital, when I was just coming out of the, the miasma of, uh, of anxiety and depression, there was a news article 
about a man who, same age as me, similar situation, went through a complete breakdown, and he committed suicide. And I remember thinking at the time, had he got help, had he paused, he could have got back to his life within a month, and his life would have gone on. But as it, as it stands now, that life came to a complete stop. And that really haunted me, that although I got that low, and yeah, I had suicide ideation, as anyone who goes through a breakdown does, it never occurred upon me to act upon it. I would, I'd never do that to my children. I just, I just couldn't. And part, the reason the breakdown was so hard was because there was no way out for me. I had to live, if not for myself and my children, because there's no way I would ever leave them. Did you need to do extensive research in the, in the writing of the book? Well, I say I'm a method um, writer. It's, it's a bit absurd to have a complete mental breakdown in order to write a book about it. So it was uh, the cut up before the horse on that occasion. I had the breakdown and then uh, I wrote the book. Uh, my research tends to be very personal. I talk to other people uh, who've had breakdowns. I talk to people who suffer from depression and anxiety. Um, but because I've lived it myself, I, I, I think I can write about it with a fair degree of authenticity. You've got two very strong characters in, in the book, the protagonists. Um, the central character is Declan, who narrates the story, and Lisa. How would you describe their personas? They're both fairly withdrawn because of events that have happened in their past. Declan is a little more open because he has close friendships with, with Chris and Mate. And he's also very close to his mother. And he, although he doesn't get on so well with his sister and his father, he does still try. Lisa, on the other hand, is really completely withdrawn. She's very badly damaged by events in her past. But Declan is, is drawn to her because he sees elements of himself in her. And that's why he pursues her. Not that he's trying to be a knight in shining armour. He just, he just wants to reach out to her because he's attracted to her because he sees a kindred soul. From reading the book, um, it seems that it seemed to be a very personal story. Um, and I was thinking that, as I was reading it, that, that was Declan or is Declan you? Yeah, Declan's me as a 17-year-old. Simple as that. I, it, it, he was the easiest character I've ever written because I just put myself back to being 17. and. Uh, yeah, it was so easy to write. I felt it, it worked better for me writing about my experiences, but as a 17-year-old rather than um, a 40-something guy. It was much easier to tell that story uh, from his perspective because a lot of teenagers do go through this. Is Declan's plight representative of many people in today's world, in your view? Um, I'm surprised how much it's writing this book and even talking about my own breakdown. How many people have said to me, I've gone through this, I'm going through this. It does draw people out. And I do believe something like 50% of Australians will suffer some form of mental illness. I mean, that's a staggering amount. And so by being open and honest about it, I hope to just add to the, to the, to the canon and add to the argument and I'm an open book myself. I do not hide what I went through. Uh, I'm not embarrassed by what I went through. I just want to be, I want to try and help in some small way. And if people want to reach out to me in the middle of the night because they're standing on a cliff, I will go and help them straight away because I've been on the metaphorical cliff edge as Declan has been in the book. And you know, life does get better. The trouble is when you're in the midst of despair, you need a healthy mind to get you through, but your mind's broken. You're relying on the very thing that is damaged, and that's why you need external help. And we have to be honest and open and be not, and not be afraid to put up our hands and seek that help. If one of your children uh, went through or is going through what you've gone through now, and you, and you saw that, what would you say to them? How would you address it as a parent? I do that now. I try to preempt it, and I, I regularly say to them, "There is nothing that we cannot be together." 
And so by having completely honest and open lines of communication, by looking at little nuances, if they're ever down, is it just a, are they feeling down? Is it just a normal the result of a bad day at school or a bad result at sport or is it something deeper? So having gone through that myself, I'm able to spot the signs in others. And so particularly with my own children now, I will wrap myself around them body and soul. And not just my children, my friends as well, I will take care of them and I will just be there, probably be a pain in the ass to them as well, but I want them to know that it does get better. But you're, you're thinking with a damaged mind at that time, so you need help. And whether that's through medication, cognitive therapy, just lots of support, lots of love, um, but that support is there. You just got to put your hand up. And men, we don't do this well. That's what I found out when I was in hospital. The women were more honest about what they'd been through. The men, I found, couldn't or wouldn't articulate what they were going through. And I found that they kind of kept to themselves in grip therapy, clammed up, whereas I was honest and open and articulate enough to talk about what I was going through. The book The Pause really starts out as, as a book about suicide. I mean, that's how, how it appears. And, and young Declan, the protagonist, really has a lot of deep and dark thoughts. But the book is surprising insofar as it's not about suicide, is it? It's more about a reason to live. Yeah, it's... If I felt this was a book that people perceived as a book about suicide, I'd be horrified. It's supposed to be the antithesis of that. It's about hope. It's about pausing. It's about don't commit that final act because life does get better. And it's about seeking help. And what Declan becomes aware of is that he, he went through some really serious stuff, stuff that he bottled up, and he wasn't able to deal with it. And as open and as honest as he had a relationship with his mother, it was still too big for him to deal with. It all got packed away and it came back. It came back to haunt him. And it almost led to his death. And so the book is about, is about hope. And there's just no way I was going to kill off my protagonist. Um, that just didn't occur to me. Yes, it's a book that openly discusses suicide and the consequences of that suicide, not so much on the person, but on those that are left behind. Because that scar will sit with your parents, your siblings, forever. That will never be healed. And so I want teenagers who are the most vulnerable. They act rashly and irrationally. And I want to just give them a little pause moment and if this book can do that fantastic. If this book save one, if it saves one life, if it sells 10 copies and saves one life, then the work I've put into it is worth it. What did you learn about yourself through the process of writing the pause? Not so much from writing the pause. The pause came about because I was recovered, but when I went through my breakdown, I've been around depression and anxiety for most of my adult life. You know, just, I suppose it's the nature of being an author. but. When I had my breakdown, and I broke down over the course of a year, the 2011, the whole of that year, I lost 15 kilos. I didn't have 15 kilos to lose at that time, so I ended up looking very gaunt. And people were saying, oh, you're losing so much weight. And I was going through this hellish time, but I did not see it coming. It, was, it just crept up on me like a thief in the night. And I'm someone who's fairly open and fairly articulate about mental illness, but I did not see it coming. And if that can happen to me, how easy it is to happen to, to, happen to teenagers or, or other people who just are not aware of this, this monster sneaking up on them. And it can, it can lead you to the most appalling, self-destructive things. But once you seek help, um, and you know, the pause was my way of helping myself and also helping others. One often hears when, when there is an issue uh, around uh, youth suicide, for example, or any, anyone who suicides, that, that close friends and close family often say, I didn't see it Correct. coming. I mean, if only I'd known, if only the yeah. person would speak to me about their issues. How important is opening up to others? I think it's the most vital thing to have this communication. It's, it's, it's the communication I have with my children regularly. I just say, I tell them together there's nothing that we can't fix. And that's just my way of saying, you can talk to me about anything. There is no subject off limits, particularly mental illness. 
if you go through anything dark, I want you to talk to me about it. And I always ask them how they're feeling. Probably too much. It's like, I'm fine, Dad. But we've got to be open about it. And one thing, since my breakdown, and I know other people who've gone through it, and they, they, they keep tight-lipped about it. Mental illness is still almost a no-go area. I think we're more honest about it now. But, you know, if you break your leg, people will cross the road to sign your cast. If you break your mind, people will cross the road to avoid you. So I've been honest about it. I go to a school talk, and I'll talk to hundreds of teenagers at a school talk, and I'll tell them I had a complete mental breakdown, and I've been in a psychiatric hospital. And there's this silence throughout the room. But afterwards, someone always comes up and talks to me and says, I've been through some really dark times. Thank you for being so honest about yours. And that's my way of, of helping. By, I'm an open book. I will say, yes, I had a breakdown. But yes, I got better. And the times I've had since then, I wouldn't swap for anything in the world. It did get better. What do you hope your audience will gain from reading The Pause? I hope they recognise the main character as little shadows of themselves. Uh, hopefully some are fine, but for the ones who are not fine, they'll say, yeah, I recognise this boy, I recognise this girl, and I realise now that, yeah, that I want to give them hope. So, which is why I project into the protagonist's future um, till, they're, till they're both about in their early 30s. I take the story that far. So, and despite what happens to, to Lisa towards the end of the novel, uh, they still have this magical life together. John, thank you for being so open and honest and thank you for sharing your journey uh, that's led to the publication of The Pause and congratulations on what a fine book. Thanks, Stefan.